Welcome to the Sex Ed for the Modern Bed Show. I'm your spicy host, Tara, and today I'm here to expose, uncover, and share what I know about SEX. This isn't what you find in your typical sex ed class. Juicy sex talk is under discussed, and I'm doing what I can to change that. Sex is evolving. People are empowered more than ever to detach from cultural norms and design the sex life they crave. And hey, if you're looking for more after the show, I invite you to get social with me. My Instagram is the.sexed.show, and I'd love for you to give me a follow. Today's conversation is both deeply personal and profoundly transformative. We're diving into the intricate world of healing through touch, exploring the intersection of somatic sex education and trauma recovery. Joining us is the incredible Melody from Body Soul Journey, an expert in somatic sex education in the realm of trauma-informed practices. Today, we embark on the journey to understand how trauma often held within the body, can impact our sexuality, relationships, and overall well-being. We unravel the complexities of trauma, exploring how it manifests physically, emotionally, and energetically, and explore the role of somatic sex education and sexological body work in reconnecting with the body and healing. What sets these approaches apart and how they offer a pathway for individuals to reconnect with their bodies and embark on a journey of healing from trauma. Consent and empowerment are integral components of this exploration, and we'll spend time understanding how these concepts are seamlessly woven into our somatic practices. From consensual touch to setting boundaries within sessions, we share insights into the empowering nature of this transformative work. With gratitude and respect, I recognize that these conversations unfold on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, as well as the Sutina Nation and Stony Nakoda peoples. This land holds the rich history and traditions of its Indigenous stewards, and I acknowledge the significance of their connection to Treaty 7 territory in our conversations. So as we prepare to unravel the connections between somatic healing and trauma recovery, I'd like to take a moment to attune ourselves to the language of our bodies. Again, this somatic inquiry is simply an offering. And if this is something you're not interested in doing right now, simply fast forward a few minutes and you can tune in to where the interview starts. So taking a moment to find a comfortable space perhaps shifting your body a bit, giving a little wiggle, and just noticing how you can invite 10% more comfortability and pleasure into your body. And allowing your body to settle into a posture that feels supportive. Perhaps closing your eyes gently and begin to notice your breath. Noticing the cool air as you inhale in, the warm air as you exhale out. Inhaling the essence of possibility, allowing it to fill every corner of your being, your body. And on your exhale, Releasing that stagnant energy or tension, creating space for the exploration ahead. Notice the weight of your body on the surface beneath you. Noticing what's supporting your body, a chair, a couch, Maybe you're standing, maybe you're walking on a treadmill or out for a run right now. Noticing the slight pull of gravity tethering you to the earth. Connecting with the sensations in your feet or your seat, grounding you in this present moment. Acknowledging each part of your body, listening, getting curious without judgment. Bringing your attention now to your heart center. 
with your breath inviting a gentle expansion, creating a sense of safety and openness, noticing your heartbeat, a rhythmic reminder of your body's capacity for healing, renewal, love. And consider this, what message is your body holding today? What stories, what sensations linger beneath the surface? Embrace this with compassion, understanding that this is a space for tender exploration. And in the next few breaths, inviting a warm golden light to come over you, radiating from your core, extending beyond your physical form. Inviting a profound connection with yourself. And if your eyes were closed, gently, slowly opening them, as you carry this newfound awareness into our conversation today. Welcome, Melody. So good to have you here. Thank you, Tara. It's so good to be here. Thank <laughs> you for inviting me. And thank you for that beautiful meditation. Uh -huh. Ah, that somatic inquiry. I was um, so much more relaxed than when we started and feel more connected. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Good noticing too. So I didn't really share too much about you, your practice, kind of what you do for listeners tuning in right now. Uh, Melody is a fellow colleague in the somatic sex education, sexological bodywork field, but I'd love for you to share a little bit more about what you do in your practice and what you offer, maybe a little bit about yourself, some personal story. Sure. Yep. Thank you. I discovered somatic sex education in February of 2017. I was attending a Betty Martin workshop. <clears throat> I was already on a healing journey and I knew I wanted to focus on sexuality because that's where I, you know, my deep healing takes place. And I attended a Betty Martin workshop like a pro Ooh. and oh my gosh. And it changed my life. Yeah, I was sitting there and I thought, and she, you know, there were embodied practices, felt sense exercises during the workshop. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I got to go do this. This changes people's lives. This is it for me. I felt like that's just why I'm here on the planet. Mm. It's to help people heal in this way through deeply embodied experiences because of a little bit about me is I grew up in my head. And part of that is an academic focus, but uh, also a, a response to trauma. You know, being in my head felt safer than being in my body. Mm -hmm. And so did being busy. So I used that as a way to kind of cope. Mm -hmm. And so it was a long journey I didn't even start exploring my sexuality. I grew up Irish Catholic. So just all of that. And I didn't even start exploring my sexuality until after my marriage ended in my 30s. And my journey led me through to discover that I'm kinky, which I had no idea. I remember when I began even exploring sexually, I figured, okay, I'm an Irish Catholic gal or previously Catholic, I must be pretty conservative. I just assumed everyone liked to be tied up. It didn't occur to me that it was kinky. <laughs> and just all this stuff. But kink allowed me to have a more, have playful experiences with sex instead of shame and guilt laden messages and just totally negative prohibitions. And so it was a huge and wonderful healing teacher for me. Hmm. When did you start exploring kink? Kink? Or even know that it was yeah. like a thing. Right. I was exploring it before I knew that it was kinky. 
You know, I, after my marriage ended, I moved to Boston and I studied jazz and I immersed myself into music. And for me, music is also so deeply healing. And when I am singing, it is like the most, most restorative thing I can do for myself. Mm -hmm. And so I was living in Boston and I ended up with a partner and we explored all kinds of fun things. And we took an erotic massage class with a group that I had no idea was the Boston Dungeon Society. <laughs> and then they had this fair, which was the precursor to a big event called the Fetish Flea Fair, which I don't think survived COVID, sadly. And I remember buying these things called bed bonds that you put under the mattress and then D-rings all around and you could just tie someone up so easily. And I thought, that's just the coolest thing. Let's get it. <laughs> and having no idea that, you know, that wasn't what everyone did. Yeah. I didn't start really studying kink or immersing myself in it until a few years later around, oh, around the year 2000. I was reading a book. And I got just super turned on by some of the stuff in it. And I was like, whoa, this is, this is weird shit. You know, <laughs> like, what does this mean about me? And so I joined, I became, you know, started going to meetings of this group in New York called the Oil and Spiegel Society, TESS, where every week they'd have meetings uh, with different topics, like dominant women submissive men night or spanking mm -hmm. night or, mm, pony play and age play and they'd have panel discussions and demonstrations and it was and uh, parties but they'd have like chaperones for the beginners it, and because New York is kind of an intimidating place to just jump into the scene and it made it safe enough for me to begin to show up and explore and start to just check these things out mm -hmm. and that led I kind of went off the high dive Choo! into the deep end for a few years and and then I was like okay it's time to have a real relationship I like took on these normative values as the right way and I'm like okay I'm done with kink I like literally put all my toys into a bag and just like left them somewhere and I regret that those bed bonds were in that bag like, you know um, but oh well I bought new toys since then but still but I judged yeah, and really tried for a number of years, maybe 10 to do monogamy. So I had serial monogamous relationships that were vanilla and so unsatisfying for mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. and, and eventually I just had to come back around to accepting who I was, mm -hmm. you know, and it, I was like, it just has to be okay that I am kinky. And probably not monogamous either. Mm -hmm. So I started putting my toe back into the kink world and attending events. I love the emphasis on education in the kink community because I love education too. I'm a teacher and a healer. So that was probably around 2014, 15 that I, you know, kind of came back home as it were. Mm -hmm. And, but I, in the working through of the judgment and coming to a place of self-acceptance, I worked through a lot of my stuff, inherited stuff, you know, embodied beliefs that were just so negative. Mm -hmm. And I became a safe person for other people to talk to. And then a bunch of people just started saying, oh my God, I can just talk to you and you'd be such a great sex educator or sex therapist is what people would say. Yeah. And I'm... Another piece of my background is that I am a mechanical engineer. And so I had a, I worked in engineering for years, decades. And I was like, hmm, mechanical engineer, sex therapist. You're a <laughs> sex therapist. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, those, those are about as far apart as you can get. Yeah. And, and I was like, you know what? The time is going to go by anyway. And what the heck? Because I quit engineering once already. Like I said, I went and studied jazz. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I've done this. I can do this. So I did. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I continued to work. I'm grateful uh, for that financial privilege. It allowed me to pay for my education. And grateful that COVID hit just when I, I needed a severance package. <laughs> so that I wouldn't walk away without a paycheck. 
very hard to walk away from some of these normative values and uh, the things that come with them. Like it required, I say in my bio, every ounce of courage to leap into the unknown of the counter normative. It yeah. was like, you know, in the matrix, Yeah. like I left, I left the matrix and I'm like, whoa. That's exact. I totally relate to that. Absolutely. It's very scary because the world isn't set up to feel supportive for people who are quote, leaving the matrix and following yeah. the counter normative way of being. There's so many different ways. So ways of being, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of when you noticed that you were living more in the head and not as much in the body? Would you, would you say that happened like around taking the, like a pro with? Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. And Here's the effect of trauma piece. I also had some accident. Well, that's trauma too. Physical trauma. This is a type of trauma, car accidents and the like. I would have intense pain throughout my body whenever I would go to an embodiment workshop. Hmm. It, it, like a pro was not the first one. Like I was already studying sex ed. And when we would have our in-person intensives, even though they weren't like a deeply embodied thing, they were kind of. I would just be wracked with pain. And even in my somatic sex ed studies during two courses two and four, the in-person intensives, I would be in so much pain, you know, and I'd line up massages. And, and then the interesting thing is I would leave and go home and the pain would go away. Huh. Interesting. Over and over and over again. So I'm like, okay, you know, the negative beliefs and the fears are so deeply in my tissues that it's it's coming out this way mm -hmm. it shifted well after my mother died mm -hmm. which is not a coincidence I'm sure you mean like shifted to have less pain yeah I started yeah. feeling safer in the world uh wow yeah it was powerful is that typically how people experience trauma in an embodied way? Like a lot of pain, a lot of discomfort. Is that something common that you've seen? In I don't know. You know, I've never actually talked about people showing up for like courageous experiences that they're doing to move away from the, the ties that bind, as it were. Mm -hmm. What I have noticed is, pain, like I just finished a dearmoring course and there's all kinds of ways that trauma can get held specifically in the pelvis, but throughout the body and pain, numbness, tension, rigidity. Mm -hmm. And like I said, there's different kinds of trauma. I had some car accident trauma, physical mm -hmm. injuries. I had some early life developmental trauma. That's something that modalities like neuroaffective touch address, like just not being parented perfectly, which none of us are. Mm -hmm. And as young beings, we develop holding patterns in our bodies to compensate for the less than perfect safety, you know, or the less than safe environment. Mm -hmm. And then there's shock, shock trauma. Well, I guess car accident is a form of shock trauma or, you know, major sexual trauma, rape, being in a natural disaster, these kinds of trauma can also hugely impact the body and the fascia can get stuck. You know, the, the fascia drying up and getting stuck is another way also where we hold unprocessed emotions, you know, so traumas can range from the mild to the severe. Right. And what might be mild for somebody could be severe for another body. Exactly. Yeah. Cause we're so neurodiverse and different and unique. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like a car accident that I'm in my, you know, for years and years, I'm noticing the trauma from that where someone's like, oh yeah. Like I crawled out of my car and I'm fine. It's like, right. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I mean, that happens and not expecting everybody to deal with similar traumas in the same way too. Yeah. I mean, I have experienced such deep healing 
through through the sexual healing work in conjunction with a lot of other stuff. I started my spiritual journey at age 29. I call it a spiritual journey, but that's why my website's body soul journey. I think that everything's connected, the physical body, the energy body, the wider, whatever there is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes even in traditional therapeutic modalities, the sexual is kind of like, that's, the counter normative. That's the taboo. And it's kind of like put in a box and like, oh yeah, I recognize that there's some issues coming up, whether it be like common sexual concern or pain, like anything. But therapists are like, I don't know what to do with this. Like what, like, where do I go? And so that's why I find the type of work that we do to be so needed in the world. Oh, so needed. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a wonderful compliment to a lot of the tradition, traditional, the, the, the modalities where they're not going to address physically sexual trauma or healing mm-hmm. or, or even going near the genitals. Right. Even neuroaffective touch, which I have studied as wonderful. It addresses developmental trauma and sort of like the chronic holding patterns in the body. Yeah but they won't go near the pelvis. And I'm like, there's a lot of stuff people hold in their pelvises. And so it's a wonderful compliment. It is. Yeah. Do you mind sharing a little bit about the neuroaffective touch? Cause I, I, I know about it, but our listeners mm-hmm. are probably like, what is this? And I've used it a few times with clients and it's been a pretty profound session when I introduced this into sessions with clients. So yes. Yes, I heard about it not long after I finished my somatic sex education training. It's developed by a woman named Aileen Lapierre, and she's oh, she's really brilliant and gifted and amazing. And I read the description, and I'm like, mm, gotta go do this. It addresses, as I said before, early life development, developmental trauma, and the sort of chronic tensions and holding patterns that humans take on to you know move through life as best they can given the circumstances under which they grew up and uh, so it draws like SSE it goes back to the work of Wilhelm Reich who developed character structure and there's other modalities too that address that there's so many like different branches of that address somatic healing but neuroaffective touch uses really gentle touch and holding with presence and gentle inquiry and also supportive of both the mind and the body and tuning in as well to safety all at every step of the way is it safe enough now or is there any reason why it wouldn't be safe enough and it encourages a dialogue between the mind and the body to you know because sometimes there's a pretty hostile or negligent relationship between the two so just very gently encouraging heart mind dialogue body mind dialogue and so some of the tools support the body in completing some of the sort of relational movements that we develop uh, through babies ideally into into childhood and early adulthood and the, like the first tool and one that it's I, i've also used with clients very profoundly it's called a nurture surround and you're basically cradling someone in a nest you know, really paying attention to making their body feel so at ease. In a sense, it sort of simulates being in the womb or floating, but also held. Mm-hmm. And there's no excess pressure and tension. So just really supporting the body, supporting the spine. There's these nice warm pillows you can lose in. It's making something super comfortable so that the muscles can let go of their holding. Like you may prop pillows underneath limbs so they don't have to work. The muscles can really begin to relax. And then I may actually stand behind the person to support their back. Or uh, again, it's encouraging of choice and voice because you're constantly checking in. How's your neck? Does your neck need to be supported? Would you like a blanket here? You know, so they get to tune into their body and then choose and notice if they need anything else to feel maximally comfortable. Mm-hmm. And then with presence and compassion, hold space Mm -hmm. for whatever bubbles up and really profound things can bubble up. Yeah. 
in that space of being supported. And also the body then gets a felt sense of safety and also that it's possible to let go because the first relational movement is yielding, just surrendering to being held. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's a lot of us that have never gotten to have that experience. No, I remember we went to the retreat together in June Yes, and there was like the demo for that. And then we also practiced it and like the kind of the steps with it. There was one point when the person sharing it was like, and then usually they cry and there's <laughs> emotional release. And I'm like, yep, yeah, every time I've introduced that, there's usually a sense of some type of emotional release that happens because we're never, we don't really set that up for ourselves. And that's why having a practitioner or somebody that you see guide you through these can be really helpful because I mean, when, when do, when have I ever set up a timer for an hour and a half and like done that for myself? Yeah. Never really like, yeah. And having somebody guide that and holding that space is so profound and really helps to sink deeper into the healing that's available through it. Yes. And we're healing relational wounds and, and relational wounds can be healed in relationship. Right. With the intimacy, because there is a sense of intimacy between practitioner and client. We spend a lot of time developing that and nurturing that with our clients. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And there are other relational movements that we could talk about, or that would be the whole hour though. <laughs> I know. Right? You know, but they also translate in adult life into one's ability to do, to be intimate. Mm -hmm. You know, the early life relation, the movements around the mouth, the reaching, the grasping for the, the caregiver's breast or the, the milk source and the sucking in and the pulling, you know, digesting and then pulling away and letting go when satisfied. If those aren't satisfied, actually, then it can impact a person's ability to, you know, kiss, ask for their desires to be met and really connect intimately as an adult. Wow. You know, so there's definite links, right? You know, maybe indirect, you know, but there's, there's effects. Yeah. I remember the one with the belly button, like the um, navel, yeah. the navel, if like you were adopted, that seems mm -hmm. to be really profound because that connection might've had trauma when you were in the womb and connected to the birth mother, the birth person. Yes. You may have been swimming in her stress hormones. Right. Yeah. And yeah, that's one good point too. Like trauma can start at any stage of development, you know, from the womb to our age right now, like there's not really a time limit on it and, and it manifests in many different ways in our bodies at every stage of our lives. Yes. And healing can happen too at any stage and in right. wondrous ways. And sometimes without trying, like I recently, li li literally this week, you know, one of the effects of trauma is chronic holding patterns. And only since I was really focusing on this work, did I realize that my toes, my, my right toe, well, my big toe rather points up. It has my whole life. And I just thought that's how it was. Mm -hmm. But I saw it. I always get holes in my shoes and socks at the big toe. And Wednesday I was barefoot and I looked down and I realized that my my toe had gone down flat it was grounded so in a sense that big toe was like well, i don't know if it's safe to be on planet earth mm. you know if it's something somehow something really young and i don't know what happened because i didn't like do any work around my feet that week or anything but for some reason my body felt safer to be here and the mm. toe dropped wow and such a subtle change that, you know, the average person wouldn't notice that because we're so disconnected from our bodies typically. Right. Right. Yeah. 
It, but it's subtle and profound because the first time I, right. I did chat about it with a friend, he was like, well, what happens if you actually put your toe on the ground? So I, I had to like force it. Sorry for all these sound effects. Um, oh, I love it. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and it felt totally different. Huh. Like my posture shifted because the the muscles that were holding the toe up and then up the calf and it's all connected. Yeah. You know, and then in SSE, we talk about how the foot is connected to the pelvis through the fascia. And so it felt very different, but I couldn't force my toe to stay down on the ground. Mm -hmm. But probably the accumulation of all the healing work that I've done somehow on Wednesday, I woke up and my toe just was just in a relaxed place touching the ground. Wow. I know it's so cool. Yeah, it is so cool. I love this work. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I, that kind of like brings me into wanting to shift into like why when we're working with clients or doing this work ourselves, why consent and empowered choice and voice is such a amazing big piece, which kind of brings us into the like a pro because mm -hmm. honestly, that's where a lot of my shifts I started to notice too. I was like, holy shit. Yeah. My whole life, I have been a martyr. Mm. I'm like, oh my God. And it all is rooted in trauma and wanting to feel seen and not be invisible. And my value was in helping people, even if they weren't asking for it. And, you know, that was, that's a lot of my trauma and childhood trauma that came up. And it wasn't until I took that like a pro training that I was like, wow. Yes. This. This, I can see why it's the root of all of our work. It's such a foundational piece. Yes. I work with the wheel of consent, usually in the first session with a client uh, and begin that, that whole kind of revolutionary process of speaking directly and clearly about who touch is for mm -hmm. and also noticing my desire and clearly asking for it instead of saying something indirect like i would say would you if i wanted something i'll be like well what do you think of this even if it's dinner you know or you know something that's small instead of directly saying i would like to have chinese you know i'll be like wouldn't chinese be good tonight or mm -hmm. i bet you'd enjoy that but just all these indirect ways of it's actually manipulation it is. Yeah. Desire smuggling is the term. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. I remember hearing that in another one of your podcasts. That's so great. That is what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And people struggle so much with, well, I mean, we're not really empowered with that. And again, it all comes down to trauma, fear of rejection, fear of hearing no, not feeling yeah. valuable or seen really. So we're like, oh, instead of really asking for what we want, I'm going to manipulate yes. this into getting what I desire. And people don't even realize they're doing it. Yes, right. Because it's so ingrained. Right, yeah. And, it, and if someone has used indirectness, manipulation, to get what they needed in an environment where it wasn't safe to be direct. Yeah. It is about survival for them. It is. And it, it goes way, way back and probably was effective in the environment where they grew up. Yeah. So all of the things that I bring, that clients bring, that we bring are like marvelous adaptive coping strategies for getting needs met in in less than safe environments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so true. So holding that space for that revelation too of you weren't a bad person. We weren't bad people. Right. We did and learned what we had to in order to survive and nurturing that person of who we were. And again, going back to this is why it's so helpful to work with an SSE or sex bod because there is that sense of tenderness there and holding the space for that as well. Yes. In a non-judgmental way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, Kind of like honoring, like what a good job and effective 
way of going through the world they had. And here are some more tools so that you have more resources and can make different choices. It is totally about empowering them to have more choice mm-hmm. and how they respond. Mm-hmm. And yeah, like setting that foundational piece up with our clients and really encouraging them to use their choice and voice. Because as we move through to further sessions, I tend to not offer much touch in the first session, but touch is a huge part of our work and a really great modality for healing trauma in the body. At least it's been that with me and my clients. Do you mind speaking a little bit about like touch in what we do with clients who might have experienced trauma and are struggling with finding safety and pleasure in their bodies? Mm -hmm. Like you, if someone comes in, I have an intake form that I share with folks so that I can get a bit of an upfront understanding of what's in their body. Mm -hmm. What have they gone through? What was their early life like? because that holds so many clues. I don't bombard them with a ton of questions in the beginning, also realizing that they might not feel safe enough to share that vulnerable of information right off the bat. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I'm like, we'll just talk about it when you get here. If it's too uncomfortable to just like write that and send it into me. Mm -hmm. So during the first session, we'll have a slowed down conversation about what's on the intake form what their desires are, what their intentions are for the work. And so if they share something, you know, tender or poignant or just super meaningful, I'll be like, let's take a breath and just Mm -hmm. notice like, wow, what you just shared was really profound. What do you notice in your body? Because often folks will come in without really being that connected to their body and they'll be like, well, nothing, you know? And so I may break it down like, "What what do you feel right now in your jaw? What do you feel in your throat or your, what do you feel in your heart, your solar plexus, your, your guts, your pelvis, Mm -hmm. you know, and then breathing as far into those places as, as is comfortable. So encouraging them during the conversation to also feel, but also setting up like Peter Levine in his book, sexual healing talks about the process of pendulation. You know, we want to work in the neural learning zone where it's maybe pushing the envelope a bit, but not going into fight, flight, or freeze. The stress response, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we don't force intimacy or vulnerable things ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And I may ask someone to bring in something that makes them feel real safe or to, you know, to imagine a place where they do feel as safe as possible, a real place, or maybe it doesn't exist on earth and they create one. You know, but if, and to notice when it does, when they start to either go up into their head or over their shoulder or wherever, where they are not able to feel in their body, then be like, let's pause and go to a place of safety, either holding their safe object, looking at something that makes them feel safe, you know, pendulating back and forth, or even just going back to feeling their body supported by the chair or the sofa. Mm -hmm. and depending on what's happened you know and how the trauma has affected them well we will start with other you know we'll start with the wheel of consent and just talking about the principles of it and who touches for and how to use the language of direct speaking Mm -hmm. to talk about touch a lot of people don't have a sense of what a desire feels like in their body It's true. And so starting to work on that with exercises like, may I, will you, uh, exploring the dimensions of the wheel of consent, but without actually doing anything like low stakes, Mm -hmm. I'll kind of start where the risk is low. And, you know, gradually when things feel safe, maybe we'll add touch like from the arm to the shoulder, like really clear boundaries around where touch takes place or not. Mm -hmm. You know, we may do a boundary exercise where we're standing quite far apart in the room. They are in control of how close I move to them and they can stop me at any time. But the goal of the exercise is nothing more than to notice when something shifts. Yeah. And just practicing 
noticing subtle shifts inside. And that's, and Corrine Diachuk has developed this thing called the spectrum of consent, which we explore kind of in conjunction with the wheel, the spectrum of response. Yeah. Me. Yeah. Yeah. And so exploring, what does a yes feel like in your body? Yeah. Today. Yeah. Um, what does a no feel like? And then we got this big gray zone and we only want to play in the side that's kind of toward the green where yeah. it's okay. It's either you're either really wanting something and feeling an actual desire or you're, you're curious and willing to do it. Mm -hmm. If it's for me, if it's for them, I want them to actually be all the way over in, in wanting it. Yeah. So we practice a lot with just noticing what's, what are you sensing in your body? Uh, and then we can kind of step through things like the bossy massage where they're, they are totally in charge and it doesn't have to be a massage, massage on the table. It can be, they're going to tell me that they want me to touch them in some way, like laying a hand on their arm mm -hmm. or touching them with the tip of my index finger, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever. They're curious. Curiosity is huge in, in exploring. Mm -hmm. Just being curious and noticing. So beautiful. It is. And it is such a, a sacred privilege to be with someone mm -hmm. doing this sort of somatic inquiry work. I know. Creating I, safe enough container for it. I agree. I just feel so lit up every time that I have a yeah. client in my studio. And yeah, I really savor the slowness of it and taking my time with clients. And sometimes, you know, it's easy when you're operating through your head to think, oh, I'm here and I want body work in the first session. Mm -hmm. But your body is like nowhere near right. that, that spot. And that's why it's really important to gently guide and get curious about what is the body actually asking for? What is it available for even? And inviting these assessment pieces, some of them are assessment pieces, so that people get a felt sense of what the body is truly asking for and what they are available and online for. Because chances are, like if we're going too fast, too much, too soon, you know, re-traumatization is just going to take place in the body. And then the work that we've set up to do is just basically going to go out the window and we have to start over with that or with a new practitioner. Yeah. And we live in this culture of faster, more, you know, no pain, no gain. Right. Push, push yeah. through. Push, push. Yes. Yeah. And uh, that's what we're healing from. Yeah. Yeah. I do have a lot of other clients like I will get folks who are just touch starved. And sometimes I say to people, you know, maybe what you want to start with is just a, a two hour sensual massage so that we nourish you or perhaps a cuddling session. Because so I did the cuddlist training, which I just found wonderful. And Betty Martin's work also influences that because touch is the only one of our five senses that is essential for our survival and to thrive. And especially during COVID, there's a ton of people who are, who haven't been touched in ages and nourishing them with touch and with pleasure right off the bat, may be the best way to support mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. You know, they might not even be ready to do the intake form. I mean, I, I always make sure that they don't have a a big trauma history, mm -hmm. you know, but, but when I first started out, I think I've shared this with you before. One of the ways that I uh, put myself out there to clients is basically on an escort site mm -hmm. um, because who's heard of somatic sex education and sexological body work. And I want to help some, a lot of my clients are men. Mm -hmm. And I feel as part of my calling is to help heal men, not exclusively, but and the, most of them find me through this site, not knowing what they were looking for, mm -hmm. but finding me. And I'm very explicit about what I do. I'm like, surprise, here I am. 
And, but sometimes with them, we'll start with an erotic massage and that kind of settles their nervous system enough that they can then begin to feel, if that makes any sense. It does. Yeah. I find a lot of the men that I've worked with are quite touch starved. Mm -hmm. And I struggle with that as a practitioner. That's not my wheelhouse. And Mm -hmm. that's why most of the people I work with are women, Mm -hmm. femme bodies and non-binary and couples. And Mm -hmm. because for my nervous system, I don't know if I can have essential massage in the first session simply because I, I notice that sure in my body. Yeah. And that's so important to honor that yeah. I offer a complimentary call up front before I'll ever see anybody. And part of the reason is that it helps me to tune in and feel if I feel safe enough mm-hmm. to offer this person a session. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's the intake is, it's pretty, uh, integral to you feeling safe enough to be able to expand that offering to, to touch in the first session. But I, I totally understand where you're coming through from with that. And I've even had some women who come in and they're like, they're wanting body work in the first session. And it's, it's a mix between making sure they're at a place where they can say no or stop. Mm. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And if I feel comfortable enough with that, then perhaps that might be an offering, but rarely do I have people who are that. I mean, I feel like I attract a lot of people with a lot of big T trauma because that's kind of what I've built my practice on. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) most of the time having that first initial like wheel of consent session helps to establish that and then go from there. But I really like to work with people who have experienced trauma in their body. Yes. And because of that, it's, it's a tough offering in the first session. Oh yeah. If this is making sense at all. I don't oh, know. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. If if people are coming like with the big T trauma, definitely. And uh, more and more I, I am finding those kinds of clients come to me. Mm-hmm. And I, I love it. It is mm-hmm. such a, it's so so profound to get to share a, a person's healing journey. Yeah. And if we get to a point of touch some clients it's taken like 10 sessions, but where, like, how does touch, like going back to where you said touch is an essential sense that we need for human survival. Like how, how is touch such a profound sense for us? Why is it so such an amazing tool on our healing journey? Biologically, I'm actually not as totally like if I could scientifically say why touch is necessary, but I know that studies have shown that in babies who are not touched of not just humans, but other kinds of mammals, they just shrivel and have permanent problems if they aren't touched when they're young. And here in North America, we're a pretty touch averse culture compared to a a lot of other cultures around the planet. Mm -hmm. And so In fact, I was reading The Body Keeps the Score Mm -hmm. and learned that a lot of the trauma research that uh, Bessel van der Kolk studied came from the British, one of the most touch-averse cultures in the entire planet. And it was these traumatized men, primarily, who developed some of the initial trauma research, which is interesting (laughs) to me. Um, But anyway, if we aren't touched we don't thrive, Mm -hmm. you know, touches. And it could be that it's just the largest organ, you know, and we're just so filled with nerve endings and yeah. But for whatever reason, I mean, we could survive without a sense of smell. Yeah. You know, we can be blind. This wouldn't, you know, it would impact our lives, but we would survive, Mm -hmm. but we cannot thrive and be healthy in isolation. Mm -hmm. Touch in 
sessions with a practitioner, really what it does is the the neural grooves, the neural pathways from our body to our brain, because we're using neuroplasticity, touch as a modality, as a healing modality, really can integrate the felt sense of safety and pleasure. I want to say the fastest, faster than going to a therapist and talking about it and understanding the concepts of the trauma and what it's how it's impacting your life. Like, yes, I understand that. But to try and like change the way you are or change your perspective is really hard when it's just your brain working and touch is a modality that can help to change that quicker. Am I right here? Yes, because trauma stays in the tissues yeah. in the form of little constrictions, held tension in the muscles and in the fascia. And when you can meet a place in the body that's holding something with touch, with breath from the inside, uh, all the tools, you can add sound, the vibration here, because it's also a form of energy and helps to also, if you're working with the pelvis, connect the jaw and the pelvis which in the womb are basically, they grow apart, but they were together initially. Mm -hmm. the, the process of healing trauma, you know, is like using breath, sound, touch, and maybe bringing some rocking and movement in. And also using the imagination. Mm -hmm. Like if there's places in the body that are more resourced, like where do you feel the most pleasure and aliveness? Then kind of either holding both of them or imagining the one nourishing the other, you know, the combination of breath, sound, movement, touch, and imagination really are the package through of which, what we do. <laughs> yeah, that trauma can be released. Yes. And sometimes it comes out as tears, maybe one of the most huge ways of yeah. letting things go, but making sounds as well, like converting that into sound energy. Yawns. Yawns are a huge sign of release in the fascia and the diaphragm. Mm -hmm. Shaking, mm -hmm. like shivering almost. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like those, those trauma release shakes. Feet. I, I've noticed a lot of my clients have like their feet always moving, like wiggling around. Just ah, during sessions? Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. so cool. Yeah. What about like ears ringing, those kinds of things? I don't know. I, mean, I don't I know either. Just, yeah. <laughs> I suppose there is no end to the individual things that will happen in a person's body. Yeah, that's good. That's a good point. Yeah. And, and there are certain things I do too, particularly if someone has been traumatized with abuse or attack in any way, is that I will offer them many opportunities to feel two different choices and make the choice you know my session room is behind us and I'll be does it feel better with the doors open or the doors closed mm -hmm. with the curtains open or the curtains closed you know and and sometimes they won't be able to say what they felt but they're like oh I definitely prefer this one yeah and just allowing them so many opportunities to choose or does it feel more comfortable if I stand on your right or your left mm -hmm. often if a person has been like I was abused from the left and my body responds differently on the left I have different holding patterns even because that's where I tried to protect myself yeah and so just kind of being mindful of that when I'm working with someone as to what what makes their body feel the safest? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really beautiful. And I mean, what other practitioner are you going to see who even thinks about asking those questions? Really? Like you go to your gynecologist, you don't have much choice in voice. Oh, no. <laughs> you, you go to a pelvic floor therapist. For the most part, I mean, there are some great ones out there, but it's the routine. Here's our routine. We're not, we're not talking about trauma or if you're, if it feels better if I'm on your left or right, unless you're asking for that. But that, I mean, 
that's such a scary thing when you weren't ever given the tools to empower your choice and voice. It's really hard to find that on your own. Yeah. And I had clients come who were traumatized by different kinds of medical. Yes. Medical trauma. And, yeah. yeah. Even getting my, so I have Invisalign now, but getting these little like things on my teeth, they mm -hmm. didn't explain to me what was going to happen. I'm not a huge fan of like dentists and I felt, I was like, that was, that could have been handled much better with a simple conversation of letting me know what was happening so I could make an informed choice for myself. But mm -hmm. I left there feeling like pretty fucking pissed off actually. And mm -hmm. it's like, could have I'm explained sorry. this to me. I've never even had like a cavity filled in my life. And then I come in and you doing all these things to my teeth and it smells and sounds. And it was very sensory overload. And that was just getting these little pockets on for my Invisalign. And I mean, the things that we endure every day, medical prof professions or not, really take away that sense of empowered choice and voice. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. In a sense, the healthcare system is neither. No, I would have to agree. Something you mentioned earlier about how the hips and jaw were connected when we were forming in the womb, that kind of brings me to one of the Instagram questions that I okay. received. If you're okay to move on to that right now. Sure. Okay. So this question was, how can I release trauma that is stored in my body? I feel it in my hips and jaw. Mm -hmm. Me too. All the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that is a, in a sense, a long journey, perhaps, you know, I would say noticing is just the uh, the best place to start. Mm -hmm. Noticing and letting yourself just drop into being present. It's hard to just stop the chatter, the itty bitty shitty committee in the head. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. 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 But just choosing to pause, to notice breath, you know, to begin to just be curious and explore what's what you're feeling mm -hmm. just noticing it could be something like a body scan anything that kind of brings you into the present moment something you love doing like i said before i feel music is very healing for me even some of the practices i learned from my voice teacher just really gently being just tiny little squeezes and mm -hmm. letting go and a gentle squeeze of the hip and a letting go and kind of chasing any subtle sensation that comes with relaxation. Practicing breathing into different parts of the body as if, you know, your imagination lets it flow. Mm -hmm. And just noticing and being compassionate. Oh, it's a little stuck there. And, mm -hmm. you know, and not, not forcing. Definitely not forcing. It's not something there's a quick fix for. No, there is no, yeah. So uh, there is no formula because mm, you're you and you went through your special set of circumstances that led to the holding patterns in your body that come from the trauma that you experienced. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it, it can be really helpful to work with a compassionate body-based person, whether it's a somatic experiencing practitioner, a neuroaffective touch, a somatic sex educator. My voice teacher mm -hmm. is a healer. And I'm like, you're doing the same thing I am, but she's helping singers unlock their jaw by working on their pelvis. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I work with people to unlock their pelvis by working with their jaw. <laughs> How cool. But even just intending to be kind to your body and all the brilliant ways it's taking care of you by holding right? And whatever other numb being numb or all those brilliant adaptations for minimizing pain mm -hmm. and self-acceptance maybe is not an easy or instantaneous thing, but a process you know, this is definitely one of those things about, it's about the journey. Yeah. And just being compassionate, gentle, 
self-loving and self-forgiving as possible and noticing. Mm -hmm. Noticing is the biggest skill. And knowing it's, it's a journey. It's not, it's not a race. Right. To release that trauma that's stored in your body. Understanding that it is a journey. It takes time. I'm still on that journey. I have so many jaw and hip issues and I've been doing this work for almost three years and like aware of it. And I mean, I'm still, you know, rubbing up against my learning zone all the time and noticing that there's always more. Oh yeah. Same here. (laughs) Yeah. Or I'll just pause. Oh, when was the last time I took an inhale? Yeah. right. I I stopped breathing a little bit ago. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I find waking up the hands too is a really great way for me to like reconnect with my body. Totally. Open up that direct pleasure route. And like every time I do it, I'm like, oh, this little exercise, I notice my pelvis, my pussy, like waking up and all I'm doing is literally feeling something and noticing the pleasure in my hands. That's all it is. (laughs) Yes. Wow. Yeah. The awakening the hands is so that's another thing I try to introduce in the first session or the Me second too. one at the yeah. most. Yeah. Oh yeah. It is a game changer because hands are full of nerve endings and they can be 24 seven sources of pleasure. Anytime we just pause exactly. and tune in. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I tell people red light. Yay. Feel up your steering wheel or, <laughs> or whenever. Yes. Yeah. I'm- I say the same thing, my clients, I say, um, put something beside your bed in the morning. So when you wake up, like just spend two minutes in your bed before you get out and notice, like you can even feel your own hands, but just getting into that. I mean, it's, it's like going to the gym. It's like working out the, the more that you're able to have little moments of embodiment and awareness in your daily life, the more accessible that's going to be for you as you mm-hmm. go further. Um, yes. Yeah. It's profound orienting toward pleasure. Yeah. 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 And it doesn't happen overnight. And it's always something that we can practice and invite more into our lives. So we're kind of at the end of the session already. Wow. Wow. I know time flies. Is there anything you want to share before we close out any summarized key takeaways? That healing often can happen in relationship if it's safe enough. That's the, that's the part about working with a safe practitioner. Mm-hmm. If it's safe enough, sometimes it's safest to start with yourself. Yeah. Yes. And just honoring, honoring and trusting or uh, celebrating even where you are and that where you are is your, your best at the moment, which is great. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure that I didn't say that very well, but yeah. You did. Thank you. That's such a, it's such a great reminder for us too. I'm curious where people might be able to find you if they want to learn more about you, Melody. Yes. I have a website, bodysouljourney.com. And that's the easiest way to contact me. You can set up a complimentary call. That's a place where we can already begin to feel the breath and just talk about what's going on and feel into if it makes sense to work together or or just even next steps to take. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I I will be starting a YouTube channel because I, I just love sharing the different somatic practices, body meditations, even just the wisdom and sharing my own story of my own healing journey. So I am starting a YouTube channel. Yay. Yeah. Yep. Love it. Yeah, I'm excited. Excited because I want to share the work and not everyone's able, there's not that a lot of people on the East Coast who do this kind of work. Yeah. I know they're all on the West Coast where we are. 
there's mm-hmm. both you and I, <laughs> like you on the East Coast, me in the mid. There's, yep. not, there's not many. <laughs> no, there aren't. Yeah. <laughs> and I am grateful that I have a little community here. Yeah. And things like, but anyway, I'll, that's our retreat. But yes. <laughs> yes. So yes. And I work with people online as well. Right. It's not the same exactly, but there's just so much that can be done and I can send support. Mm-hmm resources share as much as I can with you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on here today too and talking about a really vulnerable topic. Uh, I've been wanting to do this particular topic for quite some time. So I'm happy that you said yes to it. And thank you to all of my listeners for tuning in to the Sex Ed for the Modern Bed Show. If you're looking for more ways to connect and access information, please follow the show's Instagram at the.sexed.show or my individual Instagram at sexed for the modern bed. And until next time, claim your pleasure, own your body and stay in presence. Mm-hmm.